it was completely dark. I felt the darkness, but nothing else, and my head rose, feeling it, like the head of a worm. Someone was moaning. Then a great, hard weight smashed against my cheek like a stone wall, and the moaning stopped. A chisel cracked down on my eye, and a slit of light opened, like a mouth or a wound, till the darkness clamped shut on it. I tried to roll away from the direction of the light, but hands wrapped around my limbs like mummy bands, and I couldn't move. I began to think I must be in an underground chamber lit by blinding lights and that the chamber were full of people who for some reason were holding me down. Then the chisel struck again and the light leapt into my head and through the thick, warm, furry dark a voice cried, Mother! Air breathed and played over my face. I felt the shape of a room around me, a big room with open windows pillow molded itself under my head, and my body floated, without pressure, between thin sheets. And I felt warmth, like a hand on my face. I must be lying in the sun. If I opened my eyes, I would see colors and shapes bending in upon me like nurses. I opened my eyes. It was completely dark. Somebody was breathing beside me. I can't see, I said. A cheery voice spoke out of the dark. There are lots of blind people in the world. You'll marry a nice blind man someday. The man with the chisel had come back. Why do you bother, I said, it's no use. You mustn't talk like that. His fingers probed at the great, aching boss over my left eye. Then he loosened something, and a ragged gap of light appeared, like the hole in a wall. A man's head peered around the edge of it. Can you see me? Yes. Can you see anything else? Then I remembered. I can't see anything. The gap narrowed and went dark. I'm blind. Nonsense! Who told you that? The nurse. The man snorted. He finished taping the bandage back over my eye. You're a very lucky girl. Your sight is perfectly intact. Somebody to see you. The nurse beamed and disappeared. My mother came smiling round the foot of the bed. She was wearing a dress with purple cartwheels on it, and she looked awful. They said you wanted to see me. My mother perched on the edge of the bed and laid a hand on my leg. She looked loving and reproachful, and I wanted her to go away. I didn't think I said anything. I said you called for me. She seemed ready to cry. Her face puckered up and quivered like a pale jelly. How are you? I looked my mother in the eye. The same, I said. I want to see a mirror. The nurse hummed busily as she opened one drawer after another, stuffing the new underclothes and blouses and skirts and pajamas my mother had bought me into the black patent leather overnight case. Why can't I see a mirror? I had been dressed in a sheath striped gray and white, like mattress ticking, with a wide, shiny red belt, and they'd prop me up in an armchair. Why can't I? Because you better not. The nurse shut the lid of the overnight case with a little snap. Why? Because you don't look very pretty. Ugh. Just let me see. The nurse sighed and opened the top bureau drawer. She took out a large mirror in a wooden frame that matched the wood of the bureau and handed it to me. At first, I didn't see what the trouble was. It wasn't a mirror at all, but a picture. You couldn't tell whether the person in the picture was a man or a woman because their hair was shaved off and sprouted in bristly chicken feather tufts all over their head. 
One side of the person's face was purple and bulged out in a shapeless way, shading to green along the edges and then to a sallow yellow. The person's mouth was pale brown with a rose-colored sword either corner. The most startling thing about the face was its supernatural conglomeration of bright colors. I smiled. The mouth in the mirror cracked into a grin. A minute after the crash, another nurse ran in. She took one look at the broken mirror and at me standing over the blind white pieces and hustled the young nurse out of the room. Didn't I tell you? I could hear her say. But I only... Didn't I tell you? I listened with mild interest. Anybody could drop a mirror. I didn't see why they should get so stirred up. The other, older nurse, came back into the room. She stood there, arms folded, staring hard at me. Seven years bad luck. What? I said, the nurse raised her voice as if speaking to a deaf person. Seven years bad luck. The young nurse returned with a dustpan and brush and began to sweep up the glittering splinters. That's only a superstition, I said then. From the back window of the ambulance, I could see street after familiar street funneling off into a summery green distance. I had pretended I didn't know why they were moving me from the hospital in my hometown to a city hospital to see what they would say. They want you to be in a special ward, my mother said. They don't have that sort of ward at our hospital. I liked it where I was. My mother's mouth tightened. You should have behaved better then. I sat in bed with the covers up to my neck. Why can't I get up? I'm not sick. Ward rounds, the nurse said. You can get up after ward rounds. The swinging door opposite my bed flew open, and a whole troop of young boys and girls in white coats came in with an older gray-haired man. They were all smiling with bright, artificial smiles. They grouped themselves at the foot of my bed. And how are you feeling this morning, Miss Greenwood? I feel lousy. Lousy, hmm, somebody said, and a boy ducked his head with a little smile. Somebody else scribbled something on a clipboard. Then somebody pulled a straight, solemn face and said, And why do you feel lousy? I thought some of the boys and girls in that bright group might well be friends of Buddy Willard. They would know I knew him, and they would be curious to see me, and afterwards they would gossip about me among themselves. I wanted to be where nobody I knew could ever come. I can't sleep. They interrupted me. But the nurse says you slept last night. I looked round the crescent of fresh, strange faces. I can't read, I raised my voice. I can't eat. It occurred to me I'd been eating ravenously ever since I came to. The people in the group had turned from me and were murmuring in low voices to each other. Finally, the gray-haired man stepped out. Thank you, Miss Greenwood. You will be seen by one of the staff doctors presently. Then the group moved on. I sat on one end of a wooden bench in the grassy square between the four brick walls of the hospital. My mother, in her purple cartwheel dress, sat at the other end. The lawn was white with doctors. All the time my mother and I had been sitting there, in the narrow cone of sun that shone down between the tall brick walls, doctors had been coming up to me and introducing themselves. I'm Dr. So-and-so. I'm Dr. So-and-so. Some of them looked so young I knew they couldn't be proper doctors, and one of them had a queer name that sounded just like Dr. Syphilis, so I began to look out for suspicious, fake names. After introducing themselves, the doctors all stood within listening distance. Only I couldn't tell my mother that they were taking down every word we said without their hearing me. So I leaned over and whispered into her ear. 
My mother drew back sharply. Oh, Esther, I wish you would cooperate. They say you don't cooperate. I've got to get out of here, I told her meaningly. Then I'd be all right. You got me in here, I said. You get me out. To my surprise, my mother said, All right, I'll try to get you out, even if only to a better place. If I try to get you out, she laid a hand on my knee, promise you'll be good. I spun around and glared straight at Dr. Syphilis, who stood at my elbow taking notes on a tiny, almost invisible pad. I promise, I said in a loud, conspicuous voice. Philomena Guinea's black Cadillac eased through the tight five o'clock traffic like a ceremonial car. Soon it would cross one of the brief bridges that arched the Charles, and I would, without thinking, open the door and plunge out through the stream of traffic to the rail of the bridge. One jump, and the water would be over my head. Idly, I twisted a Kleenex to small, pill-sized pellets between my fingers and watched my chance. In front of me, I could see the spam-colored expanse of the chauffeur's neck, sandwiched between a blue cap and the shoulders of a blue jacket, and next to him, like a frail, exotic bird, the silver hair and emerald feathered hat of Philomena Guinea, the famous novelist. I wasn't quite sure why Mrs. Guinea had turned up. All I knew was that she had interested herself in my case, and that at one time, at the peak of her career, she had been in an asylum as well. My mother said that Mrs. Guinea had sent her a telegram from the Bahamas, where she read about me in a Boston paper. Mrs. Guinea had telegrammed, Is there a boy in the case? If there was a boy in the case, Mrs. Guinea couldn't, of course, have anything to do with it. But my mother had telegrammed back, No, it is... Esther's writing. She thinks she will never write again. So Mrs. Guinea had flown back to Boston and taken me out of the cramped city hospital ward, and now she was driving me to a private hospital that had grounds and golf courses and gardens, like a country club, where she would pay for me as if I had a scholarship until the doctors she knew of there had made me well. I knew I should be grateful to Mrs. Guinea, only I couldn't feel a thing. If Mrs. Guinea had given me a ticket to Europe or a round-the-world cruise, it wouldn't have made one scrap of difference to me, because wherever I sat, on the deck of a ship or at a street cafe in Paris or Bangkok, I would be sitting under the same glass bell jar, stewing in my own sour air. Blue sky opened its dome above the river, and the river was dotted with sails. I readied myself. The tires hummed briefly over the grill of the bridge. Water, sails, blue sky, and suspended gulls flashed by like an improbable postcard, and we were across. I sank back in the gray plush seat and closed my eyes. The air of the bell jar watered round me, and I couldn't stir. When I enrolled in the main building of the hospital, a slim young woman had come up and introduced herself. My name is Dr. Nolan. I'm to be Esther's doctor. I was surprised to have a woman. I didn't think they had woman psychiatrists. This woman was a cross between Myrna Loy and my mother. She wore a white blouse and a full skirt gathered at the waist by a wide leather belt and stylish crescent-shaped spectacles. But after a nurse had led me across the lawn to the gloomy brick building called Kaplan, where I would live, Dr. Nolan didn't come to see me. A whole lot of strange men came instead. Finally, a handsome white-haired doctor came in and said he was the director of the hospital. Then he started talking about the pilgrims and Indians and who had the land after them, and what rivers ran nearby, and who had built the first hospital, and who had built the next hospital, until I thought he must be waiting to see when I would interrupt him and tell him I knew all that about rivers and pilgrims was a lot of nonsense. Only before I could do that, 
He had said goodbye. I waited till I heard the voices of all the doctors die away. Then I put on my shoes and walked out into the hall. I arrived at a big lounge with shabby furniture and a threadbare rug. A girl with a round, pasty face and short black hair was sitting in an armchair reading a magazine. She reminded me of a Girl Scout leader I'd had once. The girl raised her eyes and smiled. I'm Valerie. Who are you? I pretended I hadn't heard and walked out of the lounge to the end of the next wing. On the way, I passed a waist-high door behind which I saw some nurses. Where is everybody? Out. The nurse was writing something over and over on little pieces of adhesive tape. I leaned across the gate of the door to see what she was writing, and it was E. Greenwood, E. Greenwood, E. Greenwood. Out where? O. O. T. The golf course, playing badminton. I walked back to the lounge. I couldn't understand what these people were doing playing badminton and golf. They mustn't be really sick at all to do that. I sat down near Valerie and observed her carefully. Yes, I thought, she might just as well be in a Girl Scout camp. What the hell is she doing here, I wondered. There's nothing the matter with her. Do you mind if I smoke? Dr. Nolan leaned back in the armchair next to my bed. I said, no, I like the smell of smoke. I thought if Dr. Nolan smoked, she might stay longer. This was the first time she had come to talk with me. When she left, I would simply lapse into the old blankness. Tell me about Dr. Gordon, Dr. Nolan said suddenly. Did you like him? I gave Dr. Nolan a wary look. I thought the doctors must all be in it together, and that somewhere in this hospital, in a hidden corner, there reposed a machine exactly like Dr. Gordon's, ready to jolt me out of my skin. No, I said. I didn't like him at all. That's interesting. Why? I didn't like what he did to me. Did to you? I told Dr. Nolan about the machine, and the blue flashes, and the jolting, and the noise. While I was telling her, she went very still. That was a mistake, she said then. It's not supposed to be like that. I stared at her. If it's done properly, Dr. Nolan said, it's like going to sleep. If anyone does that to me again, I'll kill myself. Dr. Nolan said firmly, you won't have any shock treatments here, or if you do, she amended, I'll tell you about it beforehand, and I promise you it won't be anything like what you had before. Why, she finished, some people even like them. Lie down, the nurse said. I'm going to give you another injection. I rolled over on my stomach on the bed and hitched up my skirt. Then I pulled down the trousers of my silk pajamas. My word, what all have you got under there? Pajamas. So I won't have to bother getting in and out of them all the time. The nurse made a little clucking noise. Then she said, Which side? It was an old joke. I raised my head and glanced back at my bare buttocks. They were bruised purple and green and blue from past injections. The right. You name it. The nurse jabbed the needle in, and I went, savoring the tiny hurt. Three times each day, the nurses injected me, and about an hour after each injection, they gave me a cup of sugary fruit juice and stood by, watching me drink it. Lucky you, Valerie said. You're on insulin. Nothing happens. Oh, it will. I've had it. Tell me when you get a reaction. But I never seemed to get any reaction. I just grew fatter and fatter. Already I filled the new, two big clothes my mother had bought, and when I peered down at my plump stomach and my broad hips, I thought it was a good thing Mrs. Guinea hadn't seen me like this, because I looked just as if I were going to have a baby. I have a surprise for you the nurse said. Somebody you know's just come today. Somebody I know? The nurse laughed. Don't look at me like that. It's not a policeman.
Then, as I didn't say anything, she added, She says she's an old friend of yours. She lives next door. Why don't you pay her a visit? I thought the nurse must be joking, that if I knocked on the door next to mine, I would hear no answer. Still, I went out and knocked on the neighboring door. Come in, called a gay voice. I opened the door a crack and peered into the room. The big, horsey girl in Jodhpur's sitting by the window glanced up with a broad smile. Esther, how nice to see you. They told me you were here. Joan? I said tentatively. Then, Joan! In confusion and disbelief, Joan beamed, revealing her large, gleaming, unmistakable teeth. It's really me. I thought you'd be surprised. Joan's room, with its closet and bureau and table and chair and white blanket, was a mirror image of my own. It occurred to me that Joan, hearing where I was, had engaged a room at the asylum on pretense, simply as a joke. That would explain why she told the nurse I was her friend. I had never known Joan, except at a cool distance. How did you get here? I curled up on Joan's bed. I read about you, and I ran away. How do you mean? I said evenly. Well, Joan leaned back in the chintz-flowered asylum armchair. I had a summer job, and I felt terrible. I had these bunions. I could hardly walk. In the last days, I had to wear rubber boots to work instead of shoes, and you can imagine what that did to my morale. I thought, either Joan must be crazy wearing rubber boots to work, or she must be trying to see how crazy I was, believing all that. Besides... Only old people ever got bunions. I decided to pretend I thought she was crazy and that I was only humoring her along. I always feel lousy without shoes, I said with an ambiguous smile. Did your feet hurt much? Terribly. And my boss kept buzzing me in every other minute, and each time I moved, my feet hurt like the devil. But the second I'd sit down at my desk again, buzz went the buzzer, and he'd have something else he wanted to get off his chest. Why didn't you quit? Oh, I did quit, more or less. I stayed off work on sick leave. I didn't go out. I didn't see anyone. I stowed the telephone in a drawer and never answered it. Then my doctor sent me to a psychiatrist at this big hospital. I said, if this doctor doesn't do the trick, that's the end. Well, on this particular day, I happened to be wearing a fur coat in August. Oh, it was one of those cold, wet days. And I thought, my first psychiatrist, you know. Well, I told him I don't know what all, about the bunions and the telephone in the drawer and how I wanted to kill myself, and that was the day I read about you. How do you mean? Oh, Joan said, about how the police thought you were dead and all. I've got a pile of clippings somewhere. She heaved herself up, and I had a strong, horsey whiff that made my nostrils prickle. Joan had been a champion horse jumper at the annual college Gymkhana, and I wondered if she'd been sleeping in a stable. Joan rummaged in her open suitcase and came up with a fistful of clippings. Here, have a look. The first clipping showed a big, blown-up picture of a girl with black shattered eyes and black lips spread in a grin. I couldn't imagine where such a tardy picture had been taken until I noticed the Bloomingdale earrings and the Bloomingdale necklace glinting out of it with bright white headlights like imitation stars. Scholarship girl missing. Mother worried. The article under the picture told how this girl had disappeared from her home on August 17th, wearing a green skirt and a white blouse, and had left a note saying she was taking a long walk. When Miss Greenwood had not returned by midnight, it said, her mother called the town police. The next clipping showed a picture of my mother and brother and me grouped together in our backyard and smiling. I couldn't think who had taken that picture either. Mrs. Greenwood asks that this picture be printed in hopes that it will encourage her daughter to return home. Sleeping pills feared missing with girl. A dark midnight picture of about a dozen moon-faced people in a wood. I thought the people at the end of the row looked queer and unusually short until I realized they were not people, but dogs. Bloodhounds used in search for missing girl. Police Sergeant Bill Hindley says it doesn't look good. Girl found alive. The last picture showed policemen lifting a long, limp blanket roll with a featureless cabbage head into the back of an ambulance. 
I laid the clippings on the white spread of the bed. You keep them, Joan said. You ought to stick them in a scrapbook. I folded the clippings and slipped them in my pocket. 